Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Cafe Loop here in New York City. Pianist Junior Mance has been in the business for well over 60 years and he's played with some of the most important and most prolific jazz minds ranging from Charlie Parker to Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Johnny Griffith, Dinah Washington, Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, the list goes on and on. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk about his career and reflect on the importance of how the music that he's played has affected one, him, as well as the musicians and as well as the history of this music. <laughs> say that New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, every, every city had a very unique flow or style of music, but music was music in Chicago. Music was music everywhere then. Cats of New Orleans, they played the same, I almost said a bad word there, the same stuff that we played. Cats from our people. We didn't have no different changes. Our people, Afro Americans, we we just want to pat our foot and shake our booties. That's how we got there. And what you say is true, but it's not as true as as people building it up to be. They did that everywhere. Some of these people came from different places, and they came and settled here. And what they heard was what they got. I was born in Chicago, proud of it, learned everything I know. My father was a stride piano player, not professionally. I started playing piano when I was five years old. My father was a stride piano player, you know. And when he was working, he was never professional. He was a clothes presser every day. He came home one day and I'm fooling around. We, we lived in the, uh, this is during the Depression. I was born in 1928. Now, he came home and I'm fooling around the piano. I didn't know that he had slipped in and was listening. And he heard me just fooling around. I turned around. Now something in those days, if you were a youngster, you don't mess with your father or your parents' belongings. His piano was one of his belongings. 
And the only reason that piano was there during the Depression, we moved into this apartment. And the family that was there before us could not afford to take the piano. They didn't need the piano. That's how I started playing the piano. So my father started playing the piano. He could have been professional, but he didn't have the heart or the age. But when he saw me doing this, my father was no dummy. Yeah. So I said, Dad, can I take piano lessons on this? I was five years old then. He nurtured what I was doing until I was eight, sent me to a teacher where I learned all the basic fundamentals and everything. Upstairs over us was a saxophone player named T.S. Mims. You, you never heard of him. He was not popular or anything, but he played, this is when Coleman Hawkins' Body and Soul came out. He played it just like it was. And he was older, because we didn't get into this business that early like some of other people did, you know. And he asked my father one night, his piano player, he worked in a, a roadhouse on a road, you know, outside of Chicago. Those roadhouses where people drive along, they gotta stop and get a rest. This one had a, had a trio working and he worked there. His piano player got sick and couldn't make it. He asked my father, can I take Junior on me? My father said, what the hell is Junior going to do? He said, it doesn't matter. This guy doesn't know shit from Shinola. He just want to see three people sitting there. I went on the gig with him. This guy taught me everything, most, almost everything for a jazz musician. He taught me, I got blues changes. Taught me, I got rhythm changes. And during the day when he lived upstairs over me, he showed me, showed me the way. Another one of your dear friends you met while you were at Fort Knox, Kentucky, Mr. Cannonball Adderley. In fact, I read something that he saved your life. Explain. He did save my life because otherwise I wouldn't be here talking to you if he hadn't saved my life. I was drafted during the Korean War. Cannonball had enlisted. He had enlisted because he was in ROTC. He went to Florida A&M. He even taught at Florida A&M. And uh, by being ROTC, the Naval ROTC at that, he didn't care which ROTC, he just wanted to keep him playing. Uh, that was a four-year obligation. 
Then the Korean War they dropped it to a three-year obligation. He dropped that and enlisted in the army for three years. I said, you dumb MF, would you, man, you would, 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 you, would you drop that and enlist in, and enlist in the army for? He says, look, three years beat four years when you're in the army and there's a war going on. And he was right. Now, when I was drafted, Cannonball Adderley was there. He was head of the band. I was in a basic training outfit scheduled to be sent to Korea. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm not putting no shellac on none of this. This is the honest to God truth of what I'm telling you. One night during my training, he was teaching us how to walk guard duty. Like you walk two hours, you rest one. You walk two hours, you rest one. All night. I did my two hours, and they messed up by putting my two hours around a service club where all of the guys that weren't slated to go to Korea but had finished their training, some of them were slated to go back home, some of them were slated to go to Europe, or where, where, where the, the, there was no fighting or anything. I was slated to go to Korea. And I'm walking around the service club, and I'm listening, and I hear all this great music. I hear this alto playing. I said, who is that? It's not Bird. It's not Sonny Stitt, because I had worked with Sonny Stitt before I got drafted. I had worked with Bird before I got drafted. And I said, damn, I finish my two hours of walking, put my rifle in the guard shack. This is in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Ran around to the club and where there was, it was just an NCO club, they call it, where guys are spinning their thing like to ride their time out to keep them occupied till the time they gotta go and face them bullets in the Far East. So, I walked in, I said, Where, where's the records playing? The photo the record. I looked in, here's this big band playing. Half hefty roly, roly poly cat playing. And the band sounded like the Count Basie band. They was killing, baby. They was talking about, hey, yeah, yeah. But most of the people there was either slated to get out of the army or to go to other places, not where the fighting was or whatever. I shouldn't even have been there. I just walked in because it's on my, on my break time for carrying this rifle. And then knowing at the end of this rifle, end of this thing, I'm going to be sent to Korea to fight. You know. So, man, I listened to, say, oh, shit, excuse my language, folks. But I said, damn. I run up to the stage. Here's a guy leading the band. And Cannibal says, Geeky goes to the piano. He says, hey, man, wow, that's great, man. You coming to the band? I was just say, no. You're sending my ass to Korea. He wouldn't let me in the band because I can't play a marching instrument. He looked, he said, what? I said, they sent me because I can't play a marching instrument. I can't play da 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 on a glockenspiel. See, they, they asked me how to play glockenspiel. Do you know what a glockenspiel is? It's like Keyboard is up there. Yeah. Not like that. I told him, I said, if it's like that, I can play it like that. No, I can't play it. You know? So I had a uh, few more minutes to finish for my one hour, my hour or two hour, whatever it was that I had. And I finished it out. And I rushed back to the guard shack. The next day, I'm in the army in basic training. They took these big hoses, wet down the infiltration course, 
which is the size of a football field. That way, you got to crawl through that in the mud from one end to the other, 100 yards. I looked up. I saw a guy with a Jeep, but I couldn't see close enough who it was. He goes up to the first sergeant. He hands him a piece of paper. The first sergeant hands it back to him. Now, and nothing said yet, I'm crawling through this mud. So, you know what the infiltration course is? We shoot live machine gun bullets three feet above the thing. The only way you can die is to raise up. A guy died right in front of me because he was afraid of snakes. Snake crawled in front of him. He said, ah! Bullets cut him right in half. I said, oh, shit. What am I in now? So anyway, I got to the end of the infiltration course. The first sergeant says, man, take off. They won't see you at the headquarters. And I got closer to the chief. I said, damn, the hell is Cannonball doing there? He's already in the band. I jumped in the jeep. I said, Cannonball, what's happening? He said, shh. He said, we got to get out of earshot. What this is. So we rode a little way. He said, no, trust me. The first thing he said, I got scared again. He said, now these orders are phony. I said, man, I'm lucky to be here. Are you talking about some phony ass orders? They can ship my ass out when I get out of this Jeep. What are you talking about? He said, just be cool, be cool. You know? And he had talked with the band commander of the band. He said, we don't have a piano player. We can have an in-house piano player. So what does the band commander do? He gives me a pass. Where every, every day after I'm through crawling through the other mud, through the mud and ducking bullets, I can change into my other clothes and hang out with the band. Only for, you know, like from four o'clock to, to, not revelry, but what that is when they say it's time to cut the lights out, you know. So that was good. I did that every day for about a week. And then I showed up one day, you know, with my past. And the band is all, they're depressed. So, man, what the hell's the matter with y'all? Y'all getting ready to go to Europe? I mean, go to the Korea or something? They said, no. We're losing our drummer. He's being sent to Germany to a special services band. Now, a special services band going to Germany is a band that where they send the best musicians, and the only thing they do is play their asses off for the troops that's already there or whatever is going on, you know. And I said, oh, man, the drummer they had was good, but he wasn't like this drummer, you know. Then he said, not only that, we're losing our company clerk. I said, company clerk, what the hell is a company clerk? How do you get that gig? So they told me, well, first thing, you have to know how to type. I said, man, I know how to type. Very lightly, but only, you know what, how I learned how to type? I needed one credit to graduate from high school. What do I study? Typing. It was enough to get me out of training and get me into that, into the band. To this day, this is years and years later, because the cannonball I will always think through my whole life, he saved my life. That's why I'm here talking to you doing this. <laughs>
Diana Washington's voice was so different than Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald. She was a little more grittier and in your face with the blues, but also. Tell me how many of them that you just named sang alike. None of them. Thank you. Diana called me for a gig one day. This is after once he found out that Andrew Hill couldn't make it. She didn't bitch him out or nothing about that. She says, Diana, uh, she says, Junior, can you make a gig tonight for Mercury Records? I said, yeah, I'm not doing nothing. She called me. I went to the studio. And she asked me, you know, do you know Foggy Day in London Town? We didn't have no music, no no charts. I said, yeah, I know. Do, 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 do. We worked out something. Me, Keita Betts, Clark Terry. Uh, uh, who was this guy? He was playing with Duke, and he was on the day too. Anyway, man, we had that shit together in five minutes. We did. <laughs> Ed Thigpen was the drummer, and Keita. Mm -hmm. The first take was the take. Dinah asked me, she said, who are you working with now? I said, Dinah, I just got out of the army. Oh, no shit. That's the way Dinah talked to. No shit. I said, yeah, no shit. I had been working, I had a few... Now he said, the Beehive. Do you know about the Beehive? Where they had the greatest of the great. I worked the Beehive when I got out. Coleman Hawkins was working. This is before the diner gig. Coleman Hawkins. I said, oh shit, I never played with him. They called me to, to, to work with Coleman Hawkins the first night. The drummer said, man, what you doing? Can you work tonight? I said, I can work tonight. Come by the Beehive. I didn't know what the Beehive was. I got out there. There's Coleman Hawkins, the headliner. You know. So I get on the stand. Coleman Hawkins called to him. And, man, he was one of the greatest people I ever worked for. I said, well, man, what key is it in? Make it easy on yourself. That's what I did. Well, that night was over. Coleman was just opening that night. I had the whole four-week gig with Coleman then at the Beehive that night. He told me, he said, oh, man, no, no. And that's where those cats were. They knew what they were doing so much, which John Q. public did not know. You call a tune, they could play it in Z-sharp. Q sharp or whatever. Make no difference. I worked four weeks with Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins told me, he says, man, you need to come to New York. I said, well, man, I just got to the Army. I'm trying to get there. I'll get there. You know, it took time because after that I worked four weeks with a lot of other people. I met Eddie Lockjaw Davis, who turned to be one of my closest friends. I don't know if you heard those records with Lockjaw and Johnny. Yeah. The quartet. The quartet. Lockjaw was the second person I met. We got to hanging out after the gig every night, just talking music. I learned that was like a music school, man, working with Lockjaw. And I just got my shit back. I just got my stuff back together, you know, with the cats that I knew. Yeah. <laughs>
Time to do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at Cafe Loop here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Junior Mans for his time, as well as the staff and management here at Cafe Loop. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. Thank <laughs> you.